Lisa Murphy Noon, and I'm a free thinker and a forever recovering Catholic. Um, this is a really important subject to me because um, it kind of gave some answers and some questions of why my family was, um, well, very involved in the church and why they were also very fearful of church. Um, basically, I didn't find out until my late 20s that um, my father had been in therapy and even my mother didn't know that he'd been abused for many years, um, partially because he was in boarding school and um, they had access to him. I guess it stopped when he was starting puberty at 12 and he came out to the public and that's how I found out the story, <laughs> which was kind of awkward. And if you have time later, you can um, look at this painting, which I did with one of Joyce's workshops that I did, and it kind of represents the priest's collar piece in here, but when my father came out, it gave the courage for his brothers to come out, too, and um, so three out of five children, admittedly, that were abused, all very, well, two very successful, um, one kind of lost, and there's the website on there if you want to read more information, but it was about uh, 15 years ago, he was one of the first people to come out, and he asked for an apology from the church and an apology from the Pope. It wasn't a financial thing, um, and he did not get an apology from the Pope. But you can imagine seeing your father's picture and your uncle's picture on the news, and especially uh, my family's been in town a long time, so it was a very emotional subject. At that very same time, uh, I was pregnant and just got married, and went to a sewing shop to get a sewing machine and vacuum because I thought that's what I should do. And I found a brochure, which Joycey had, and we became friends. For and teaching was, sewing. For teaching sewing. <laughs> <laughs> and I told her about yeah. what was going on in my family. And somehow, I, uh, I think, become a more grounded person through that. And also, I've been involved in Change, change, or I always call it changing our voices, but finding our voices, um, it's been meant to be, is what I would say. And it's really uh, refreshing to know that people can go through so much damage, whether it's through the church or through someone of power, and still heal. And so that's kind of, I think, what we're here for. So this is Joyce Aubrey, and she'll give you the rest. Yay. Thank you. Well, as I was telling um, some of the people as we were sitting around waiting, this is the first time since 2008 that I've talked without my paintings. I have a couple dozen living paintings that are in, they're called process paintings, and they kind of ground me and diffuse the uh, anxiety of the presentation. But um, knowing that this is the free thinkers and that we were logical, I didn't want to appeal to your emotions, I wanted to try to give you some logical explanations. But knowing a little bit more about me might help. Um, I was born uh, to a couple very humble means in the middle of Kansas uh, during World War II, actually born in 1940. So you know that I went through the war as a little girl. And I remember that, not knowing we were poor, because everybody else around us was poor as well. Went to a one-room school and never expected to go beyond high school, but um, because of an appendectomy, uh, actually in a pe burst appendix when I was 15, and um, an abortion, uh, the result of the ancestral family trafficking, occurred, and that physician phoned my mother, had his wife phone my mother and ask if I could come with it. That's the one place that I sometimes cry when I give this presentation because that was this, that was a saving grace. You know, not every sexual abuse survivor has something as wonderful as that. But they treat this doctor and his wife had three sons, but they treated me like one of their own. And my last two years of high school, they insisted that they wanted to take me down to the university in Manhattan, Kansas, and. Uh, go through the entrance exams, and I ended up getting the master's degree, even though my brothers had never gone to college or considered it. 
I was one of three children. One brother was eight years older. One was 18 months older. Um, we went to a very conservative church. And um, I like to say that the guiding principle that I got out of that was uh, a Bible verse that says, I have found in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have found in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I don't understand that last piece of words. I will be content wherever I am. Whatever happens to me, I, in whatever state of affairs I find myself, right. I will be content. Okay. And that sounded a lot, and I adored my father. And uh, his mantra was, you gotta learn to play the game of life with the cards you dealt. Those are the same concept. Uh, my mother was a very um, unhappy, hypochondriac kind of person who said it's a man's world and you have to do what men want. <clears throat> Typical of her generation, of course. Um, and both of my parents lost their mother before they were 10 years old, so they grew up without that nurturing. Um, but my father was a, a warm and tender person in many ways. He taught me to love works. He had an eighth grade education and could perform poetry with the elocution of an actor. And he uh, recited Robert Frost, Edgar A. Guest, um, a lot of Wadsworth poetry, uh, The Village Blacksmith. He could do long passages. And I was so fascinated by that poetry. And so that's the confusion of a lot of sexual abuse. Um, I just uh, was telling some of these folks I spent two days in Denver uh, being trained by military uh, SARC officers, sexual assault response coordinators, um, <clears throat> how to work with military survivors of sexual assault, and they talk about the family feeling. Of, you know, you have your comrades back, and uh, it's like family, is, is how they explained it, and that's why it's so hard for survivors in the military to um, come forward and report. Well, it's the same thing in the families. It's really hard. But we know that silence is the enemy of prevention. Marilyn Vanderburg, welcome. I'm just giving a little introduction. Marilyn Vanderburg uh, was Miss America when I was a senior in high school, and she popularized uh, that statement that silence is the enemy of prevention. And that is precisely why I speak out, because I believe that it is through run-of-the-mill, common, everyday folks exposing the subject and the epidemic proportions of sexual assault that will make a dent on how much, uh, <coughs> how much at the prevalence of sexual assault. I'd like to start with three thoughts. Anytime I speak, I hope that when you leave, you understand that sexual assault is an intimate violation of body and spirit, and it remains in your cellular structure until it's released. I've had a lot of body work, physical therapy, massage, um, my fascial release, rolfing, uh, Phoenix Rising Yoga Therapy, yoga, and lots of things like that that help it to, the, the trauma to come out of my cellular structure. The second thing I want you to remember is that it remains in the psyche until it's released. And that can be done with talk therapy. Uh, there are lots of things like EMDR and emotional field therapy, which is really tapping. Uh, there are many different modalities for releasing it from the psyche. Um, most of us have done a lot of letting go exercises, uh, energetically letting it go uh, by uh, putting things in balloons and releasing them by um, standing in a shower and releasing energetically. So somehow we get it out of our mind and out of our cells 
And the third and most important thing is that the hard work of healing is worth it. And it is not simple to heal that kind of trauma. Um, I wrote uh, some poetry that kind of explains why I chose to spend my retirement working with the nonprofit. And it's poetry that um, I used when I got the award for advocacy, and I'd like to share that to kind of set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. I have a story to tell. I don't know how to do it good. I'd like to lift my voice and shout, but I don't know if it's safe to let it out. The sordid things I've done and the dark places I've been Maybe you or you will think acknowledging incest is a sin. The pious can call me a sinner, but I'm determined to be a winner. I'll speak my truth. Oh, whoops. I faced my demons and came out stronger. My body doesn't ache and weep any longer. <laughs> because I screwed it up a little bit. Um, I'll speak my truth right out loud. I'll heal my wounds and make little Joyce proud. My abusers can hate me and call me crazy, but I will not use that as an excuse to be silent, isolated, or lazy. My kin folk are mired in hate, anger, and greed. Why would I follow their I'll sing in the sunshine and dance in the rain and be grateful for love and friendships that keep me sane. Little Joyce and I have come so far. We've healed so much. We've heard the angels whisper and felt a touch. Now we're one, and we've begun a show of passion. And this mission is like a little nibble of glory when we can empower other survivors to heal and share their story. So other than sharing my opinions, I'll share that. Um, when I had, I, I lived a very normal life in many, many ways until my mid-50s. And I started out as a home ec teacher. Then I, I was a counselor at a community college and taught social science classes. Then I decided I didn't really like that too much, so I spent more than 20 years as a fabric shop owner and a fabric shop and sewing machine retail sales. <clears throat> and I was successful in that. I was a very, um, I think, amicable person, cooperative person, got along well with people, always established rapport easily had a, a good clientele for my store because my people pleasing that I learned as a abuse survivor served me well in the retail industry. But I always had one characteristic that nobody understood and it was I would explode. And I didn't know my triggers, of course. Those of us who are Survivors of any kind of trauma know that we have triggers. And we understand those triggers now because we know that uh, the sense of smell is very close to where repressed memories are stored. So I always had an aversion to Clorox. Um, you can guess why. Um, when my youngest, I have two sons who are now in mid 30s and 40s, but um, one of my sons, when he was 13, was watching Miami Vice, and he didn't like what happened. And I was over here sewing <coughs> in one corner of the basement, and he was over here watching TV in the other corner. And he clicked off the TV and said, what? And when I heard the F word, I leaped across the room and attacked him like a wild animal. Now, I didn't slap him like a normal mother might have or scold him or shake him. I mean, I was scratching, kicking, biting 
insanely angry. And that was in 89. And in 93, I had the flashback to where three fellows, eight to 10 years older than me, were taking turns, and one of them said, you lay real still, because we're going to fuck you until you die. So 40 years later, that shows cellular memory in my mind. Forty years later, I felt the fear of death when I heard my son whom I love say the word. I flipped. Now, I just came back from Oakland, California, where I presented at a conference for ritual and severe trauma survivors. And I did a PowerPoint presentation with my uh, healing paintings. Before I presented, I heard a Harvard um, medical researcher, brain neurobiologist, talk. And he explained how when traumatized at a certain age as a child, the corpus callosum that divides the two hemispheres of the brain doesn't let them communicate the way they normally should. So when we get a trigger, that's why a PTSD syndrome has always been irrational anger, irrational rage and outbursts. Now we know why. So we have to rebuild those circuits. And that's what learning to recognize triggers does for us. So we can rebuild those circuits so we can temper our reaction rather than flying into rage without a second thought. And I was like, oh, those kinds of things make it so much easier to forgive myself for the things I did to my children because I hadn't had my memories. I didn't, it, repression is such a difficult thing to understand. Does everybody here feel like they understand something about repression? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's difficult, and it's unbelievable in so many ways, but it really does happen. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so I think that, that that will give you some idea of my background. Um, when I had incest memories, my husband of 35 years didn't want someone who was crazy, uh, a partner who was crazy, and... I came out here to um, hold on to my sanity, and I did. And uh, spent from 90, I actually, I started having memories in 93. The divorce happened in 95, and I moved out here. And so um, I actually spent more than a decade healing before I was ready to talk about this. And since 2008, I've talked about it a lot. Um, so that is background. Now I'd like to give you some of the logic. Um, why, why should you care if you are not a survivor? Um, oh, let me back up to, uh, I did say that I uh, wrote the nonprofit. I started working with Finding Our Voices art show in 2008, wrote the nonprofit application in 2009, and um, since then I've become affiliated with Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and that's where a lot of my information comes from. But I do have a lot of websites that um, that I consult, California Coalition Against Sexual Assault is one of them. Uh, Washington State also has a very good um, website of information and do free webinars. Then there are other internet sites like Prevent Connect. And for male sexual abuse, there's a website, one in six. So the things to consider are the prevalence, the consequences, the impact on society, and then the myths surrounding it. And I, I hope I don't bore you with too much um, statistics. But if 
if these statistics were true of the measles, we'd be doing something about it in our society. We just, we are still in denial as a society of the epidemic proportions. In Colorado, uh, in 1997, oh, I think I did that wrong, I think it was 2007, there were 1,790 cases of uh, reported sexual assault. And according to blind surveys, that represents 16% of what actually occurred. So it is, rape is the most unreported violent crime in our country. Uh, the United States has the highest of any country that collects statistics and publishes them. We are four times higher than Germany, 13 times higher than England, and 20 times higher than Japan. Um, so the first thing that I want to look at is the offenders, because uh, as we were visiting here before we started, we talked about um, victim blaming. Uh, the question usually, and, and in the past for certain, and maybe still present, is what was the victim wearing, what, was, what had she had to drink, um, regardless of whether she took it voluntarily or something dropped in her drink. Uh, where was she? What kind of reputation did she have? What kind of clothes was she wearing? And all these kinds of things. Jodie Foster first um, pointed that out to us in that movie, The Accused. You, has everybody seen that? Yeah. yeah. Um, that had a lot of familiarity to me, the, the cheering and jeering, because I truly believe that ours was a community kind of thing. Um, 70% of, of offenders have one to nine victims. 20% have 10 to 40 victims. And serial child molesters, pedophiles, often have 200 to 400 victims. This is why it's so important to speak out. I was absolutely certain, even after I had my memories in my 50s, that I was the only victim. But then, once I started talking, cousins, aunts, neighbors, and I began to get all this information indicating that I was not the only victim. And I, especially for pedophiles, I think it's very rare that they have one victim. And can't help but refer to the Gazette article. Did anybody read the Gazette article uh, that Randy, was it Randy Haynes, Hams wrote? That um, was feeling so sorry for the sexual perpetrator who was incarcerated and failed probation several times. And the thesis of the article was that the, that the sex offender treatment is designed for the offender to fail and that it's just very unfair and it needs to be revamped. Well, maybe it needs to be revamped, but you know, this guy failed probation several times and victims don't get probation. When your body has been intimately violated, um, so anyway, uh, in 2000, research in the year 2000, 41% of incarcerated sexual assault offenders admitted that they reoffended during treatment. And part of the sex offender program is to enter them into psychological treatment and they give them, um, what are the honesty tests that you lie detector? Lie detector. Lie detector. They give them lie detector tests and they decide <coughs> when they are ready to go back into the public and less apt to offend. 41% admitted they reoffended during treatment. What about after successfully completing treatment? Would well, it still be 41%? I mean, I don't know. that could be two weeks into treatment. I'd like to know what it was when they were <coughs> treatment, why voted healed. But 
It's an int the other statistic you gave, 1,600 people and it was 16% of the population. My math tells me that's about 80,000 cases. But I'm not really good at math. I'm not either. Yeah. But um, pretty consistently in the last 20 years, research in different states, but throughout the United States, it's pretty consistent mm -hmm. around 15 to 17 percent right. uh, of sexual assault gets reported. Mm -hmm. It's pretty right. small. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It, there's institutional hierarchy of values that sort of push those statistics aside. Like if you were to go to a college, two colleges of which one should your children go to? You ask them how many rapes do you have on your campus? They won't tell you. Thank you for bringing that up. And it may be four times difference between the two colleges that you won't be able to know. And that was something that was brought up in Denver when I took training from the military sexual assault response officers that for colleges who release that information, their sexual assault rate is about the same as the military. And yet, there is this concept in our public that um, a woman going into the military needs to consider that rape is an occupational hazard. But we don't have the consensus and the understanding that rape is an occupational hazard for college students. The teachers will be dismissed, uh, and the community won't know why, but they'll go to another state. Uh, the Boy Scouts had their own little file system that was private, and they didn't share it with anybody. <coughs> Just transfer someone to a different church. And, and the church is the same way. The, yeah, the, priests the bishops who met in Boston about 10 years ago, 30% admitted of the bishops admitted that they approved transfer of priests. And they go down to Yemez, Mexico, New Mexico. And it's just east, just west in the Yemez mountain crater there. Uh, there's a <coughs> monastery where they're supposed to get cured by prayer or something. <laughs> and uh, then they're released on the, the little villages in northern New Mexico, and uh, they suffer. The, those little villages suffer the consequences. It's deplorable, but thank goodness we're finding out about it a little bit now. Yeah. I, I think we probably just touched the tip of the iceberg, but you know about it. The Vatican. And other people in here probably know about it too. According to scripture, the Vatican should schedule a cruise ship to the deepest part of the ocean and stock it with millstones and priests. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's where the, the sermon on the plain, where he says, suffer not the children, let them come unto me, and you'll be like a child in heaven. But then he continues, he who destroys the spirit of a child should have a millstone put around their neck and dumped into the deepest part of the ocean. So his words are not matching his action. Uh, was that the previous it. pope or this? Oh, no, that's J.C.'s words. Oh, that's J.C.'s oh. the good book. He, He's talking about the good book. Though. It's the only time he calls for capital punishment. <laughs> well, but he actually time. promotes incest, which my children actually pointed out to me with Noah's Ark. Because I know after one land, he's like, well, now you know, make me some babies for those Yeah, it's in the Bible, yeah. yeah well, uh, yeah, I have some notes here, and I didn't know how much you wanted me to go into this, but um, there, are, there are some situations in the Bible that are pretty scary. Um, <clears throat> If you want me to go into that now, I can, yeah. rather than later. Yeah. No, yeah, that's good. Yeah. There is the theme of women as property. Mm -hmm. uh, the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, and of Lot uh, later sleeping with his daughters and having children. The story of Lot um, <clears throat> when 
The men in the village were going to rape strangers who came to their door, strange men who came to their door. Lot said, oh, don't touch these men. I will offer up to you my virgin daughters. Um, then uh, uh, the Levite uh, sacrificed his concubine in Judges, so that was, those are Genesis, Exodus um, examples. Uh, in Timothy, Timothy is pretty tough on women. Um, the some of the some of the Christian groups that um, endorse patriarchy to its contentment um, use these kinds of scriptures. Uh, Timothy 2.11 says a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Uh, 2.14, again in Timothy, uh, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Um, then uh, 2.12 is using coercion and threat. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And in Peter uh, 3.7, using intimidation. Husbands, treat your wives with respect as the weaker partner. Uh, and then emotional abuse in Corinthians even. If women want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Those, those are scriptures that some patriarchal groups like to refer to. They ignore uh, uh, Peter 3, 7 that says, husbands in the same way be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. Still says though, as the weaker partner and heirs of you, uh, and heirs with you. <clears throat> and in Ephesians 5, it says, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. Um, then later, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Um, <clears throat> after all, no one ever hated their own body. Well, tell you what. <laughs> Talking to my sexual abuse survivors that I've worked with the last six years, they hate their body. Uh, one of the young women who had been abduct abducted, I don't know whether it was the one in Salt Lake City or the one in California, said that she went into such a depression after being raped and one of the things was she had been taught that if she was not a virgin when she got married she was as valuable as a piece of gum on the public toilet floor. That's Elizabeth Smart That's right. and I yeah. read that on the yes. internet as did some of the rest of you. She said that that was one reason she didn't try to escape at first. But her church because had taught her that. Her church had taught her that if you have sex before you're married, you're like a used piece of gum and nobody wants to chew someone else's gum. And that's how she felt. Yeah. And, and she is going around, and now to her credit, yes. she's going around saying, think about what you are teaching your daughters. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that. And your sons. Right well, as a. As someone brought up in the Mormon church, you don't speak against authority. And and so I think it's quite admirable that she speaks. So that. brave. It's really brave. I think she was also threatened. A lot of things I've read about her situation threatened that they, they were going to kill her parents and her mm -hmm. sisters. And, you know, that was the other part of it, too. I just wanted to add, and I have no, I'll never know the real story. but. Starting with Adam and Eve, I mean, the way we all came to be, there had to be some incest, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. You're thinking too logically. <laughs> 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 yeah. How did you ever heard of that? Did you have a belly button? <laughs> the other village? I know, but, but, in, but, you know, common sense says that I can't figure out any other way well, that uh, more of us got here. So uh, just, just. Let me propose evolution. Yes, <laughs> yes. I may. Yes, you may, yeah. with me anyway, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think it's real scary. Um, there, I also read something, maybe you read this, since maybe we're reading the same posts on the internet, about toxic masculinity, that uh, where our boys are 
brought up with the violent video games right. and with the, a great deal of sex in the media, the movies, the uh, and TV. And the cartoons. And cartoons? Yeah, kid cartoons. Really? These, like Scooby-Doo, like it used to be like soft, now they're kissing in Scooby-Doo. Their breasts have changed and they're like pointy. Like we're, they were just kind of like normal. So we're, more, like, so we're normalizing it, like, violence here. and we're normalizing for sexualizing sex. things that kids that shouldn't have to be mm -hmm. dealing with in cartoons mm -hmm. and in other children's movies. And, exactly. and teaching and teaching young boys that to diminish another person makes you stronger. That that isn't That's true. Right. Absolutely. But we have that pressure. We have that in front of us all the time. Gary, what would you been saying? Oh, it, 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 I don't go to movies very often, but whenever I do, I find myself appalled at those sorts of behaviors. And I oftentimes ask the people that are with me who go to movies all the time, wasn't that outlandish that that happened? And they sort of go, no. well, no, it was just part of the story. Didn't you get that it was necessary? No, it wasn't necessary. It came out of the blue, and it was this, anyway. Yeah, they're shocking. The desensitizing. The yeah, desensitizing. Yeah, desensitizing. This is a prop, such a big problem today. And I didn't want to interfere with your talk, Joyce, but when we were talking about um, sort of defending the perpetrator a little bit ago, I am so upset uh, about the defense attorney's remarks about the man. And, and when people call the a man who's a perpetrator in anything a gentleman, it makes me crazy. Yeah, you I should know. say a man, not a gentleman. He's not a gentleman of the three women who he kept in chains and sexually abused for, for 10 years. His defense attorney came out a few days ago and said, he's really, you don't understand, he loves his six-year-old daughter, he's, he's crazy about her, he will do anything for her, he's really a nice man, you, you, you'll have to wait and hear all the facts. I thought I'd go crazy. Yeah, That's all I wanted to say. And I am going crazy right now thinking about what the defense attorney, the defense attorney is setting a scene, softening what he did, and that's what defense, all defense attorneys are not bad, so I'm not gonna, I don't ever lump people together in anything. But that has made me nuts. This is not a nice person. I don't care how much he loves his six-year-old daughter who came to being out of, uh, and sent you, uh, out of rape. I mean, it, I, I thought I was going out of my mind when I heard these remarks. That's all. I get a little scary. And I get a little scary. I get very passionate about, about what I feel. About. I get a little scary about how he's loving his daughter. Yes. Because do you remember when exactly. Oprah had uh, three convicted perpetrators yes. Yes. on her show? I did see and that. And two of them, I thought these guys have been re rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. The one who raped his cousin mm -hmm. said, "I could. I went to prison for rape. I could just as well have gone to prison." for murder because I killed who my cousin could have been. He got it. Yeah, he got it. Then there That's was right. a 68 yeah. or 65 year old man who raped a five year old girl and he said, but you know, I really loved her. Oh, isn't that kill you when you hear that? I know. But that seems like the weird thing is, you were raped by your father, but you still loved your father. It's, a I still, it's so conflicting yeah. because sometimes I know that people do these horrific things, but they do have some love. I mean, it has to work both ways. I loved the part of my father that was gentle, that picked me up when I got backed off the horse, and taught me to sing. My mother gave me piano lessons until I could accompany her singing, but my dad sang with me, and he taught me to love words. I love that part of my father. I hate the part of my father that raped me and shared me with the soldiers at Fort Riley where he worked and shared me with the preacher and taught my brothers to abuse me. That part of my father I hate. So you're able to separate those things. I can. I think that's what healing is about because I think it's just so hard to separate love and forgiveness, no matter what it is, even if it's not abuse. Just, I mean, it's just, I think it, it has to be done somehow or not forgetting. You don't forget. It. Oprah says forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could ever have been different. I don't see it that way. To me, and I think forgiveness is very individual. And 
I don't think it's a Christian concept. I mean, I know it, it is a part of the Christian doctrine, but I think that it is a universal thing of letting go of a love-hate bond. For me, whatever forgiveness is, or one of my friends says, I can't say forgive, but I can say I release you. Well, release just is just as good a word as far as I'm concerned. But somehow, because I <clears throat> got past the point where I wanted to punish or get revenge, I feel like that love-hate bond is broken. And I have one living brother, my mother, my father, and my brother eight years older than me are dead. My brother, who's 18 months older, never wants to see my face again. And that's okay, but I'm not afraid of him anymore. So that's what releasing means to me. I think your word release is good because some some situations for all of us might be hypothetical. Well, you know, could we forgive somebody for such and such? I have a hard, hard time with forgiveness if I feel a terrible injustice has been done. But the word release would help me cope. And and it may even it's, it's be more like, appropriate it's, yeah, it's because of the Christian enough. connotation. Right. These free thinkers, <laughs> and, you know, whatever. Whatever um, works for um, somebody, right? But somehow, if we remain steeped in anger mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. resentment mm -hmm. and getting even, can't function really. You're not ever going to get back to yourself. And that's what healing is for me, and that's what we work on in our weekly support groups. That's what we work on in our monthly art workshops with Finding Our Voices. Let's get back to your authentic self, who you are without the abuse. You'll never forget it. It is always going to be a part of you. But let's find a new normal where you can function. I think that's why release is such a better word than forgiveness, because forgiveness, it's like you're almost saying, like, I forget it, because for that's almost part of the word, it's forgiveness, it's like for forgetting. And, and nobody so wants you to forget. Well, no, it's not that you're, and it's not anything that anyone can ever forget, but that's why release is, I think that's a much better word, because it's, you're letting go of all the anger and hate. And it's like I went to a weight loss class one time where the instructor said, um, no, wait, I'm, I'm losing the word. I'm an old woman. Uh, it's called a brain freeze, and I really. <laughs> it has little to do with age. It happens to people Gary, as young as me. Um, it really has little to do with age. I forget things all the time. <laughs> Thank you. She said, don't, you don't want to lose weight because whatever you lose, you try to get back again. That's interesting. You want to release weight. Oh, I like that. Because when you release it, it's gone. And, you know, so. Interesting. We're not going to forget. We're going to release. Um, do you want some more stats? Are you convinced that this is I, I have a question way? about that, yes. Joyce. Um, you know, not everybody is up front. With, with statistics. Japan has a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people, and yet our statistics were higher. So my feeling is, and I have nothing against statistics at all, I find it interesting myself, but I just don't think everybody is being upfront about admission. I think that could well be, because and, and we I know like think that we how strong the family bonds right. are in Japan. Are they going to admit it? <clears throat> and it has to do with the suppression, too, because if it's something that you've actively <clears throat> suppressed, right. a researcher can come up to you and ask you, have you ever experienced this? And you're going to say, no, I have no memory of that. But and that's you know. an honest admission. But if you know that you do that, and you that lie. these things have happened, like in Japan, and, and, and they're not willing to but still to on a one by one basis you'd be asking me yes to tell you that i have this memory of this thing that happened to me when i was six years old right and if i've suppressed it i don't have no it. absolutely and yeah. so i could answer as honestly as no, i could absolutely. and i'm sure that researchers probably try to adjust for that deficiency on the Very part of probably. the audiences um the thing that interested me was you were talking about your brother using the f word or your son, 
and that triggered you to react violently to him. Um, the simple exclamation of that word might be pretty rare in your life, and it might be something, but it was interesting to me that he was watching a TV show, which I myself know to be obnoxiously exploitive of violence and, and desensitizing in general. Um, I grimace when the program is on. I try to find excuses to do something else or get my family to do something else. Was it something in that program that you were listening to perhaps, along with his exclamation, that triggered you? Or was it just his exclamation? I think it was just his exclamation because I can't stand loud noises mm -hmm. and he would have had to have had that television pretty quiet and I was buzzing along with right. my sewing machine. But he flipped okay. it off, he, he yep. turned the yep. television off and he headed for the stairs, which was next to my sewing machine, saying, what the fuck? What was it about the program that caused that reaction in him? I've never heard that. Okay. What I'm, next time. <laughs> he probably won't remember. What he remembers, yeah. and it pains me to say this, what he remembers is, Mother, the look in your eyes that day made me think you wanted me dead. Mm. But Joyce, this may be a little far out, but the F word is another word for rape. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that might have been a trigger just for that alone. But, but you think about a seven-year-old child <laughs> mm -hmm. with three older guys taking turns, and one of them says, "We're gonna, you lay real still because we're going to fuck you Well, that's it. That's, that's the that. fear of death. Right, that word. That is mm -hmm. the fear of death. Mm -hmm. implanted in my psyche and in my cellular structure, structure until it was released. Right. So when that happened, you didn't remember anything yet how it happened? So you just thought you were acting crazy and didn't know why? Right. I had no idea At that time. why I attacked him. Mm -hmm. None. And you had no effective memory of that situation before the events that happened after the exclamation, a year later when you got the memory and came to understand? It was 89 to 93, so that was four years later that I got the memory. Mm -hmm. And then I understood. And your husband, you think if he never knew about that, wouldn't have wanted to, I mean I know it was kind of a joint decision, but I think maybe it's hard for men, like I know it would be really hard for me, like, I don't have any memory of being abused actually, but I know if I came out to my husband and told him, like somehow I would feel like our relationship was different, like he would look at me differently, you know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Like a piece of gum still, the whole piece of gum syndrome. Like. Oh, you're well, not you mean as when I told him about my sweet. childhood? When you told him, hey, I had sex at six years old or seven years old, like from a man's point of view. I think that it's just hard to absorb, understand, and like. So are you asking me when my husband learned about my attack on my son, or are you asking me when I told my when husband about the incest? When he sexually abused, it's incestual and stuff. Do you think it was just overwhelming? <laughs> do you think that sometimes it's Do you just want to know time? what his words were? I can tell you I verbatim. Yeah, OK. When I came home from Colorado, because there was no help in, Col in Colby, Kansas, when I went to the mental health center, they said, we've been here 20 years, we've never been asked to work with a sexual abuse survivor. We only work with the perpetrators because their therapy is court ordered and court paid for. And they had no one to work with me. So I drove 230 miles to get therapy. And when I came home, and I had flashbacks to sexual activity, but I thought maybe I acted out in high school, maybe I acted out in college, maybe there's something I'm not remembering. But I came home with a different expression on my face. And when I walked in the house, Dwayne said, you know who abused you? And I said, yes. And he said, I want to know, but I don't think I want to know. She mentioned the male attitude, and they say, how do I put this? <laughs> There's a susceptibility of paranoia in the male ego, and it's reinforced by some religions. 
You can see it in the Muslim world, in the extremists, that they're totally in fear of anything, and it, it, it affects the whole family status in the community. It used to be here. It's At less here now. Essentially, you are my property. <clears throat> yeah, there's chattel. But the idea that the family honor is destroyed. <coughs> if, yes. It's the virginity yeah. cult and all this. And yet we've got the, we still have that in our culture, and we have the football cult, which overrides the virginity cult. <laughs> we've got all these all competing confused. things going on. Well, let me finish my story. So he said, do you want me to guess? And I said, no, I'll tell you. It was my father. And he said, oh, so Scott isn't my son. He's your dad's. Now, Scott was born after we'd been married eight years, and we lived 250 miles away from my parents. And he was conceived during final exams when both of us were teachers. And I'm quite certain that my parents were not out helping us grade finals. But that was in 1993, January of 93. I was divorced in October of 95. And as I walked out of the door for the last time, he said, well, at least I have one son. Wow. I'm so wow. sorry. That was I'm his reaction. I'm Lack of compassion. Is. I'm so sorry. I'm so even so though rashly the numbers didn't add yeah. up, in his mind. Me, and I know the blood type. The he blood type the doesn't add up either. He jumped to the assumption. And he could have kept that in his mind, but he had to hurt you worse. My and therapist he said he wants head. to hurt you and getting, and one way that he, could, you know, you are strong enough now that you can walk away. And so he's going to try to hurt you through the children. And really two years later, after many conversations with my therapist, because Scott kept saying, there's just something weird going on with my dad, and I don't understand it. And after long conversations with my therapist, I said, Scott, there's something you need to know. And I told him. And I don't want to repeat what he said. I was very sad. Because he essentially abandoned his oldest son. That's the complication and the complexity of the whole thing. I really didn't mean to get into that. I usually don't even tell that, but because you brought it up, Lisa. Well, I, 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 I appreciate that you did because there are so many people in many, many very difficult situations who are absolutely cannot find a way to accept, to understand. They have blinders on and it, I, that's hard for me to understand why people would be like that. The first time he saw me in a flashback, and my flashbacks in the beginning were like epileptic seizures. And as school teachers, we'd seen epileptic seizures. And I would fun with the mouth and scream and holler and cry. And, and um, the first time he saw me, he said, it's a good thing you told me what happened in Rolfing, which is uh, a scripted massage. Or I would have called 911 because it looked like you were having an epileptic seizure. And he said, you couldn't have faked it. That was before my brothers got to him. And after my brothers got to him, it was, you can't prove any of this. You, you know, this could all be in your head. Let's hope so. Let's say we're thinking, right? Yeah. How does the court, <coughs> different courts react to the theory of repressed memories? Good question. I love your questions. Um, I went to a lecture at Colorado College where one of the premier experts in the field of false memory syndrome gave a lecture. And when I went up and tried to talk to her afterwards, she really flipped me off. I mean, she didn't want to have any conversation with me at all. And she was making big bucks testifying for the false memory syndrome people. This uh, researcher from Harvard Medical School, um, and John Hopkins, he works at both places, um, said, and he quoted research, I don't have my notes here, but he quoted brain neurobiology research 
that refutes every one of false memory people's talking points. We now have the brain research to support the fact that repressed memories do occur, repressed memories are accessed by different access codes than normal memory. Uh, we, we have brain research to say that uh, if a child, if, if a child is traumatized before the ages of six to eight, up until age eight, there may very well be um, dissociative identity disorder developed, <coughs> which is the new word for multiple personalities. A borderline personality? That comes later. That's more apt to be between 10 and 14. Different parts of the brain shrink depending on the age at which the trauma is encountered. And what we know now is those parts of the brain can be rejuvenated, not with medicine, but with affirmative thinking, with meditation, with yoga, with exercise, with good nutrition, with positive attitudes. Now this professor at UCCS, <coughs> I think she's in, uh, focused on children who have been coached by social workers and I don't know if she did much work in adult with adults. Well her theory was that her research she did in Southern California and um, she said that that the third time that college students were told that they were abused, that, that they fell through a window and were really hurt badly. And they showed pictures, <coughs> they manipulated pictures to prove that this had happened. And the third time they told them, then they agreed that it happened. So therefore, um, or you tell somebody it didn't happen. Therefore, uh, repressed memories didn't happen. That was her explanation at the lecture I went to. Didn't happen or couldn't be relied upon in court. Mm -hmm. and it's two different things. <laughs> so that's the hardest thing when it comes to like taking sexual abuse to court because half the time a victim doesn't come out right away. Oh, because they... Because of the shame, everything that comes... Or because of them. not remembering. Yeah, or because, you know, there's just so many things why a person won't come out. So then the, by the time they do come out, it could have been years for you, many, many years. And so then when you try and take that to a court case, it's like there's no evidence and court is such an evidence-based. And you know, abuse and sexual abuse is such a personal and it's such a point of view type thing. And so they're just like, it's so much harder to have that come through. There was a, uh, a miss went through the fundamentalist church. I heard it here that there were judges and police in secret organizations. They had tunnels under schools and they took children away and had devil cults. People went to jail for this crime in New Jersey, Florida, and California based upon little kids saying, yeah, they were went down in the tunnels under the school. But when they went out and dug for the tunnels, they weren't there. So there is this, and it was a, there's something, uh, some churches really push testimonials. And pretty soon the testimonials are sort of whop, they get sort of whoppers, you know. One person tries to outdo another. Yeah. And the kids are there and they know their folks are stretching the truth. So when they, the kid doesn't see anything wrong with stretching the truth if he's been raised in that kind of environment. There's, they've tried to do a lot of research about that, and the results that I've studied say that less than one half of one percent of children lie. However, most of the lies that are fabricated um, about sexual abuse are from adults who are trying to get revenge. Well, but children themselves children themselves so rarely they're pretty, not. they're pretty innocent that's i agree with that but can't well, they be convinced that a situation transpired by repetition and 
Yes. Programming. It's that can happen. The neurons are still developing in their brains and they're making that connection. And so yeah. it can because depending on the age depends on how far up the brain the cortex has gone up through. But on a, an initial questioning of young children, Usually what they tell you on initial questioning is true. Right. You know? and, and then you know, after that, if someone wants to, you know, play with their psyche. Yeah. And that's there. why um, I, I did send someone from our group to um, have a rape sane exam on uh, her preschool daughter because of things that she was saying. And I said to her, I know that Safe Passage here in town that sees more than a thousand children a year says, do not quiz the child before they come in. Please don't talk to them about it at all. Let the professionals do the interviewing because <clears throat> they want to avoid this very thing. They want them coming yeah. in. And, and they, they also record, the they'll record the session. They'll record the, the questioning session and they'll <clears throat> it's, they didn't record the ones in New Jersey and they repeated it over and over again and it added up to many, many hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but but because it, of those cases now, that they're supposed to re be recording these. Is that current practice now to record these initial sessions? <coughs> that that they do record, if they are interviewing a child for sure. sexual abuse or sexual whatever, they do record the sessions. Okay. If it is an officer recording, if it's an officer asking of a child. Right. But for a therapist, as far as I know, they don't record it. If it's a therapist to a child, but if it's a detective or an officer of some sort, they will ask the child if it is okay to record the session. Mm -hmm. So then that way, it's proof saying the officer didn't manipulate the child in a way right. to answer the questions how they want them to be answered. Yeah, I would almost wish it to be automatically recorded anyway, just yeah. as a normal efficacy of being a therapist. Um, but there are some laws yeah. about requiring therapists uh, to yes. That's really do that. tricky because right. the therapists are specific laws. It's pr the privacy laws. The privacy right. laws. Yes. And I agree stuff. with you though, it would be a lot easier in many cases if they could all yeah. be recorded because then you can hear exactly. I think the privacy laws should be there. The therapist should be required to keep it private. Yeah. But I think they should also be required that if, you know, if they're in practice and they have a feeling that this might be a criminal situation or a high energy situation, record the first time. And if you're right and it feels like a do it more. But that's also invasion of privacy when I you agree. do a, re a recording of something. You and can't also, record it without informing. Yep, and you can inform so a child through recording, they you would clam up. Yep. Yeah. Or so the parent. How about the parent or the one of the parents? Just one of the parents. If one of the, the therapist's parents choice permission. and one of the parents ask for permission uh, but the to not record. Well, or, that's not what we're going to address here. Yeah. Really, okay. folks, this is way out of the realm of what I, what I think I can appropriately address. And it's five to eight, so we probably need to move on. Um, I. I think I wanted to make a few more points. One is the grooming that takes place. Pedophiles report and evidence confirms that, that pedophiles groom not just the child. And uh, so many times it's a trusted adult. I, where are those What do you mean by groom? They, um, pedophiles who have been interviewed say that they look for a child that doesn't have a good relationship with peers or with their family because they're kind of isolated, so they prey on that. And then they also will make sure that they gain the trust of the family, and that gaining the trust is the grooming. Okay. And then gaining the trust of the child, and then making trying to show it in the sense of like showing the child that this is my way of loving you, mm -hmm. I care for you. And if the child is in a, sh a situation where they're not receiving a lot of love or care, they're going to be okay with it. They'll do anything. It's, it's, yeah. To them, they see it as attention, even yeah. though it's really negative attention. It's still attention that they're receiving, mm -hmm. and they enjoy it, even though they don't enjoy it at the same time, mm -hmm. as odd as that might sound. Yeah. So, uh, what we know now is that 40% of child victims are abused by a family member. Another 50% are abused by a family friend or acquaintance. 
or the older child. So that leaves less than 10% are stranger. So talking about stranger abduction isn't going to prevent it. What's going to prevent this is education of families. Uh, there are, are probably 39 million child sexual abuse survivors in America today. That's a lot of people who are drug and alcohol addicted, um, eating disorders, depressed. I've often said if ever we're going to do anything about sexual abuse, it will be from the dollars and cents. And that's what this article was about in the Gazette, about how much money we are spending on sex offenders. And it's true, in the mid-90s is the last figure that I've seen, but uh, I think it was in 97 that the criminal justice, Department of Criminal Justice said that we spend $126 billion a year dealing with sex offenders in the court system. Concurrently, mental health workers reported that they took in $6 million a year from, child, from sexual abuse survivors. Half of that <coughs> $6 million came from current <coughs> and half from people who were feeling, who were trying to heal their past. So very little is being spent on dealing with the victims. It's all being spent on the perpetrators and we're not doing a very good job of it yet. <laughs> so, uh, it's, if, you, if you think that it doesn't affect you, you're thinking wrong, because if you pay taxes, that 126 billion has probably grown exponentially since 1997, and we're all helping pay for it. Um, there are some other th outcomes that I think would be interesting for you to know. 75% of teen prostitutes have been sexually abused. And if you have gone to any of the human trafficking meetings here in town, uh, they tell you that the teenage prostitutes that have been picked up in Colorado Springs did not come from third world countries. They came from Denver Junior High. An estimated 60% of teen first pregnancies were preceded by a sexual assault. Nearly 50% of incarcerated women report child sexual abuse. 70% of all reported sexual assault occurs in children under 17 years of age. And the one that you really don't want to hear is that more than half of forcible sodomy and rape with an object happens to children under 12. The most vicious kind of rape happens to children, more than half to children under 12. We need to protect our children in a different way than we are now. And disability increases vulnerability. 83%, an estimated 83% of women with disabilities have been raped and 32% of males. Um, I'm sure you all know that loss of trust, decrease in self-esteem, substance abuse, suicides, and all sorts of psychological issues are a result. Um, One thing that we need to know as families is the role of family and trusted adults is really important because if, <coughs> if an individual child or adult has been raped, not being believed and having your feelings discounted adds to the subsequent trauma exponentially. It is so much better if you are believed and if you get some kind of uh, support from loved ones. PTSD we talked about and we are all indebted to Vietnam vets because that's when PTSD got into the, the DS, what do you call it? The diagnostic oh, manual. Yeah, yeah. DSMV, I don't know, I never I know the words. But in the, the diagnostic Bible of the yes. US medical industry. Yeah. Yep. And, and you know, I, I have a lot of reservations about those diagnoses because they're so subjective and I see a lot of people living up to their diagnosis. But 
we know that in adult Americans, 5% of men have PTSD, 7% of women. Vietnam vets, 30.9% have PTSD. Female rape survivors, 60%. So, you know, I am so um, awed by the Wounded Warrior Program that Kim Nguyen does with the art, the healing art. But that gets all sort of suppressed, <coughs> and the the Wounded war the vets are able to sell their paintings for big bucks, and our sexual abuse survivors, who are also wounded don't get any attention. Just a little soapbox of mine. Uh, there's another study, if you uh, would have time to look at it, called the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And that tells us, um, especially it lets us see that experiencing physical violence, sexual abuse, and uh, maybe pornography, or a, multiple childhood traumas exponentially increases the chances for psychiatric illness and physical illness. Uh, the ACE study is, has been a very important one in the mental health field. Um, on sex trafficking, women sexually abused as children are four times more likely to work in the commercial sex trade. And here's the one that's really scary. Men who have childhood sexual abuse are eight times more likely to be in the commercial sex mm -hmm. industry. Um, we already talked about the military a little bit. There are a few myths that I don't want to miss, and one of the scariest is that some people seem to think that a male who is sexually abused as a child will grow up to be a perpetrator, and that's very hurtful to the men who have experienced child sexual abuse. Sure. Um, what they may, especially if they were abused uh, in that 10 to 14 age, they are apt to become violent in other ways. Maybe to be uh, domestic violence, physical violence, um, maybe theft, robbery, uh, vandalism. They may become violent in other ways, but not necessarily that they're going to become rapists. And I think that keeps a lot of men from disclosing. Another myth is that we can recognize perpetrators. Not. No. They look like they're the slick. rest of us. <laughs> they can be anywhere. They are. And, and they, well, we just need to be alert to one-on-one -on -one situations. I've read one research study that says 80% of child sexual abuse could be stopped if we didn't have one-on-one -on -one situations with adults and children. And so that's why adults working with children like to have at least two adults there, because it is the one-on-one -on -one situations where so much of it, it's, it's a crime of opportunity. And it's also sad that as an adult, if you are a man, if you like kids and you enjoy their company more so than even adults, the people think that's weird. You know, it's like you can't be yourself. There's always some sort of like, I don't know. Yeah, there should, know, should be a stigma for yeah. that. Because um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of uh, men who who are wonderful teachers of, right. of, of, of young children, first grade, second we grade, even men. kindergarten, and the kids yeah. love them and they're perfectly fine. And but the children the need public, those role models. There's, there's that stigma. Why, why, why are you a man teacher? teaching such young children? So you hit upon something that's very, very close to me in, in my field. So going back to the three things, remember that if you know a survivor, give them space to heal, give them time to heal, understand that it's in the psyche and it's in the cellular structure and it takes a long time and a lot of hard effort to heal. And um, another thing is just, as a citizen, support programs that support victims and hold perpetrators accountable. And the last thing is to be an active bystander. We have a couple people in our groups 
whose lives were saved by a bystander. In one instance, someone she didn't know who lived in the same apartment complex thought that there was domestic disturbance. And you know, most people are not gonna get involved in a domestic disturbance. But there was so much screaming and dog barking going on that they came up and burst through the door. And the assailant got away. She has a brain injury. She was beat so severely, but she lived. And had they not come, she would not be alive today. And I went, I've gone to several seminars on bystander intervention and things as simple as if you're in a bar and you think somebody has uh, dropped pills in a drink, spill it. You know, you don't have to, have to attack the man, right. spill the drink. You just have to have a little accent when you're done. That's right. Yeah. All right. And, and speaking up when degrading jokes are told about femininity, when um, demeaning other people seems to make someone feel bigger and better, just thinking about not the flip side, but just thinking about carried to the extreme, what is this individual capable of? Maybe I can make them think another way. And when someone says something really insulting, you know, maybe you want to say to them, do you have a sister? How would you feel if somebody said that? <coughs> yeah. That's bystander. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to get fined. But just begin incrementally to change the attitudes that preserve and promote sexual violence. And back to Finding Our Voices, our programs are open to survivors and their allies. No one has to disclose anything at support groups on or at um, art workshops because the support people for the survivors are really co-victims and we want to support them just as much. I really thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. I think we have to answer more questions too. Okay. I would like to. All right, we can give a couple questions. Um, the situation between you and your husband, mm -hmm. I would assume that after having been married for a long time, 35 and, years, and then going through the traumatic situation that you did, you probably came out of that three or four years later, very much a different person. Um, we call it a new normal. Yeah. And I could understand where it could be difficult for somebody who had a relationship that had survived for a lot of years, to have trouble coping with this new normal that was developing. And it, it, in a way, it, I think I want to say it's, it's, it's bad that he wasn't able to stay with the process. But on the other hand, the process could be very different from his point of view. And, and I do... I, you know, in, in my book, I, I say that he was a good man. He was a good provider. Mm -hmm. And because he was um, good at managing finances, I had the money to get the treatment I needed. Mm -hmm. And I spent it all <laughs> on treatment and don't have much left. But the truth is, in the 90s, I never had to stop and think, do I have the money to go to this therapist? Mm -hmm. I had it. And, and that's one reason I do what I do with the nonprofit, because so many of our survivors have no resources. And I think that Dwayne did the best that he could. He was, he was a very devout German Lutheran, Marzura Senate, which is pretty strict. And, um, um, he had a temper of a farmer, 
but he knew to kick me or hit me in places where the bruises didn't show. And um, I never told a soul. Why would I? I mean, I grew up in that kind of a family. Right. It was normal. And I had to have therapy, mm -hmm. physical and psychological, from 92 to 95 before I had the courage to walk away. Mm -hmm. So I don't talk about my situation as domestic violence because I never feared for my life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I was a battered woman, but the rolfer one time did, said to me, that's a nasty <laughs> bruise on your shin. How did you get that? And I said, oh, my husband kicked me under the table. Why was that? Well, because he said something and I said, you know what, you're, that's a tough decision, but you're going to have to make it because I'm tired of making decisions for you. And he said, I ought to beat the shit out of you mm -hmm. and kick me under the table at Edelweiss. Mm -hmm. And I said, and he said, Joyce, that's battery. And I said, but he didn't beat the shit out of me. He just threatened me. <laughs> and kicked you. And he said, that's battery. Mm -hmm. When you are used to something, it's hard to recognize. You don't see it. You don't see it. What, what did it was I thought I was ready to go back to my store and manage it. And I walked past a lovely piece of fabric because he and the quilt teacher were buying fabric. And I'd been exiled from that. And I said, that's a beautiful piece of fabric. I always loved Hoffman California fabric. Those are the beautiful colors I've seen in a long time. And he said, just see me in the office. You need to learn to keep your goddamn mouth shut when you're in the store because we decided one person has to be in charge and it sure as hell hasn't been you the last three years. So I had nothing to go back to. I, I could go back to Kobe, Kansas and be a servant, mm -hmm. but I couldn't go back and run my store that I started in 1972 and I had a very good reputation. I traveled the United States for the Viking Sewing Machine Company and taught new dealers how to sell. So I knew my business, but I couldn't run it when I was having flashbacks. Mm -hmm. And by then, it was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about how much money was spent on therapy for the perpetrators. Um, tell me that there are comparable programs that are spent on educating the families of America. Tell me about the billions that Congress has allocated for family education. How about for armies of social workers to go out and help people? Billions there. No billions there. Okay, then the Air Force has a whole division set up to help abuse survivors. Sure, they can donate. Uh, we'll give up on that. Um, what is the Air Force, what, what was your take on the Air Force's training of you other than giving you a t-shirt, which I'm sure you'll wear proudly? <laughs> I think that that this idiot who groped a woman drunk, mm -hmm. who was in charge of the sexual assault program, I don't remember his name. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. But Cluck, isn't it Chuck Hagel that is now defense? Yes. yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. Chuck Hagel got really excited when his sexual assault, <laughs> the, the top man in Washington was groping. So, what is happening is that commanders, the, the immediate boss, to, is no longer in charge of sexual assault investigations. That's a step. Mm -hmm. I think they have a long ways to go. But the SARC officers are very happy to have that. Now, it isn't taken out of the military, but instead of the immediate supervisor, being in charge of the investigation, it goes up the channel to like a two-star general. I think that's a, a hypothetical scenario they put out to solve the problem. The take I got of it was that it would be taken away from the commander and handed to the adjutant general kind of division, a legal organization within the branch of the, the military. The JAG or whatever. The JAG. So that the commander would no longer have the authority to decide if, if there'd be charges, what the charges would be, and then the authority to dismiss the whole judgment after it was finished. 
Instead, it would go to JAG, and they would have the authority to make those decisions. And each branch is a little bit of. different, but yes, that's that's kind of what's happening. And um, but in this in this article in the in the film, uh, the Invisible War. If you ever get to see it, take your hanky. They showed us that, but it was 17 women talking about the repercussions of reporting. But that 70 percent of sexual assault victims in the military say that they had career retaliation because of reporting. Mm -hmm. That's another big problem, too. Yeah, giant problem. When the immediate commander was in charge, well, it was unavoidable. Just today, the president convened military leaders at the White House to discuss the subject. And the chief of staff of the United States Army finally admitted that everything that they have done up till now regarding sexual abuse is a dismal failure. They have to start from ground zero. Here's another step. And I think it's that a step. Would, that's a step, but I'm just saying, you know, they're fine because the whole reporting system, the whole chain of command system when it comes to sexual abuse doesn't work. The chain of command works in, in combat, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for that. But it took until today for somebody, a four-star general, to say this is not working. And do you ever go to Denver <coughs> for one reason and find out when you got there there was another important reason you were there? Do you, what I'm getting at? Did you went through that? Is that what you're saying? I do that. I, I, I went to Dallas, Texas for confirmation of my sexual abuse from my father's cousin. Okay. It didn't happen. But my mother's cousin lived in Fort Worth, and I got confirmation there. I, I, it's like I had this intuitive feeling that I would find out something in Texas, okay. and I did, but not where I thought I was going to. And looking at this idiot who was in a very responsible position for sexual assault, groping a woman, yes, I'm so glad he did. Yeah, because he got caught. He got yes, out of it. He got caught. In a visible yeah. way. And it opened a can of worms that needed opened. Yeah. Joyce, when you're getting back to the statistics that you were talking about earlier, and clearly the percentage of sexual abuse, particularly on women, that is reported is small. One of them you identified as the shame that's involved in it. How much of it, however, is also because women face a bias on the part of law enforcement and she's full of baloney. Mm -hmm. they, they make the assumption as soon as a woman, well, okay, here comes another story, guys. Here comes another I'm, I'm slut. Much, I'm going to turn time until my coffee break because they don't believe it. Now, some of that is, I think, brought about by the fact that there are a small percentage of women who make up the story and it ruins it for the rest of them legitimately. Because those police officers, they may have 10 women report rape, and two of them turn out to be, uh, you know, a fabricated Fraud. story. They don't remember the other eight that were legitimate. They only remember the two who made the story up and admitted it. So that also puts women at a disadvantage. Maybe it happens to men too, but for sure with women, it definitely puts them at a disadvantage because that bias exists within law enforcement. One of the women that I advocated with who waited three years on her trial. She also has it. This is a different woman, but she also has brain damage. She was taken up near Cripple Creek, raped repeatedly. She had her, all of her back teeth were knocked out uh, because he slapped her across like this so much. And she had broken ribs and bruises and everything. They failed to um, record at the hospital that her teeth were loose and so they had to be pulled a little bit later and victim's assistance wouldn't pay for her teeth. But we found dentists who were putting $28,000 in her mouth. Mm -hmm. But when I went with her to trial, and I'm not a professional advocate, I was just a personal advocate, her abuser portrayed her as a slut and she is 
seriously diabetic. She injects herself seven times a day. And he and his friends reported how many, you know, that she had had like a dozen beers. She'd be dead with her diabetes if that had really happened. But that's how it works. Perpetrators know that their best defense is alcohol and drugs. Well, they do that at any age. I'm sorry, but okay, I'm going to reveal something personal about myself. I was abused as a child by a friend, and he was an adult. I was in court. I was 12 years old, sitting in court, while the lawyer is telling me that I was egging on a 32-year-old man to sexually abuse me. And that's the reason why he did it. They were, I'm 12 years old. I don't even know. Is that understand. your attorney telling you? don't even know. No, no, no. It was his. his. It was his attorney right. accusing me, thing. saying that I was egging right. him that's on in certain situations, and that's why he did it. Did you have satisfaction with the end of, of the court? He, uh, he got, he never pleaded guilty, but he, that was a really rough time for me, so I don't really remember most of it. But I remember that because that was. I did he get any time? He did. He did get some time, but then he re then he did guilt. He pleaded guilty, and after he pleaded guilty, they shortly after that they let him go. Oh, doesn't make any sense to me. Nope. It makes no sense. I'm nope. so sorry. Because yeah. you but, have to live with that the rest of your life. But it was just. I mean, it does not matter the age of the woman. They will always say That's that true. the child mm -hmm. was coming on to them. It. They do that. And range. my lawyer I adjusted mean, to it after they kind of like a couple of after like I think it was two questions. My lawyer was like, "What is going on? This is unrelevant. This is not whatever." Yeah. And the you know the lawyer, the judge did agree with him. But it was just I specifically remember that saying like, "It's your fault that this happened to you." Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was yeah. just like. I know. Seriously, mm -hmm. I am 12 years old. This happened like a year ago. Are you kidding me right now? Like, it, it was it's scary. It was. It was just like I couldn't believe it. And it, I remembered it for, I mean, obviously I still remember, but it would keep me up at times. It was just like, because then it would make me doubt myself for going into well, the court. Well, it feel such a great injustice, too. Yeah, because it was just like, I mean, he was found guilty. He was, you know, he served a couple of years, but he's free now. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't really keep up with where he is, and I have every access where I could if I wanted to, but then that would just make, that would bring the paranoia of, and that's really hard to get by sometimes, so. So healing takes place in the present moment. Yeah. And so I commend you for focusing on the present because that's where you can heal. Yeah. Concentrating on the past and we, we go over that and over it in support group. Yeah. Focusing I mean, on the past is not going to heal you. Oh, yeah, no, it was definitely, I mean, I've been through plenty of therapy. I've, you know, I've really moved past the situation. But I just brought it up just from the point of it doesn't matter how old the child is. How old the old child is doing? still or trying to put the child. blame on the child. be doing cartwheels with a lollipop. I've got a really I went swimming. Wow. And because I, you know, you know, I went swimming. And so I was advertising for myself, I guess. And they do, well, that's really sad with a young person at 12 because they do that with. I was, I was 11 when the yeah. incident exactly. happened. Exactly. The oh. child was like a year later. But yeah, no, it was just like, I was just like, Really? I didn't even know. I was so terrified sitting up in the stands because just having someone stare at you, and I was just like, are they saying what I think they're saying? It was that's, just, that's it was, a did lot you have family support? Girl, oh I did. I, you know, both my parents, I had lots of family support, you know, all that kind of stuff like that. So I did have a lot of family support when it came to it. It took a long time for me because it was a friend of my mother's, and it took a long time for me to move past that. I see, Joyce said. Blaming my mother. Mostly a relative or a yeah. friend. And yeah. so it was, I, took a, I took a long time for me to stop blaming my mother for the incident. Well, I just want to share that I am honored that you would share that with us. Yeah. yeah the living in the now, that's our short-term memory. And if something bad happened a long time ago, it, probably should be in the long-term memory and not it continually invading the short-term memory. And I mean, there's some techniques now where people <clears throat> tape record the, the, the event that's disturbing them in the now, and then they listen to their own voice and they write it down on paper. And then they do that 
every week, and they have the date that they write down as recorded on such and such a date, and they write it down again. And some of the patients are successful in Affirmation. getting the getting. They don't get rid of the event, but it's in the long-term memory. memory. And it out of the present memory. It does. It isn't looping around in short-term memory. Yeah, we talk about replaying the tapes. You know, something that maybe just took a few minutes, we can replay it in our mind over and over again, and that intensifies it and magnifies it. The transfer to the tape and hearing your own voice at some time in the past. That's fascinating. That was recent discovery. Are you a therapist? No, no, no way. But you read about it. There's a lot of folks in the Freethinkers group who read widely and watch what's going on. That's why a lot of our meetings are like this. We get a speaker who comes in and we know nothing about you as you walk in or maybe one person does and we find out the beauty in the person by listening to their story and by asking them questions. And this is a real typical kind of meeting that we have. Um, this is the first time you've been here and several other people but this happens every month usually with more people, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really pleasant when it works this well. Let me close it with this. Oh, did you want to say something? Well, I just was going to add, a little while ago you were talking about the fact that you had the resources to get the therapy necessary and that so many people don't. Even people who do through insurance, it's limited by every insurance company in the world that if it's a mental health problem, we'll pay for 25 sessions, and that's it. And as you know, there's long-term therapy for many, many problems, and you can't, you can't put a time limit on it. Because of the cost involved, that's what insurance companies do. Dwayne charged me $75,000 for my therapy, and he had the bills to prove it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's a problem, it's an ongoing problem, um, to be able to, for the people to, to get the therapy, even if they have some coverage, is mm -hmm. limited. And that's why groups are so useful, where support, groups. support right. groups and things like that, that don't necessarily involve professionals and don't require their outlay of money. But one victim helping another, helping another. We say we just help build cope groups. with the daily life. Yeah. Okay, let me close with another poem that has served me well throughout the years. Don't ask, where does this lead? Consider the silkworm and the seed. Does the silkworm ask, where does this lead when spinning the cocoon? The spawns are transition. Does the sea question its burial and groan at the shattering that produces a new leaf? Don't ask where a new situation leads. Remember the silkworm and the seed and burst through each barrier, walk through each open doorway with new wings and expanded vision. Like that. That's very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've been a delight. And, and you all added to it.